Now, we have been in a sermon series in the book of Ephesians, and like I said uh, before, we're wrapping up, we're landing the plane, and so when we started the uh, series, uh, we skipped the first 14 verses, all right, and we, so we jumped straight into Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, and I said to you that we'd come back to it, and, and now is the time, right, so we've made our way through the book of Ephesians, and, and now we're landing the plane on Easter Sunday, and so we're going all the way back to Ephesians chapter one. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me there. Um, or if you have it electronically, uh, you can click to there as well. Um, it'll be up on the screen as we navigate through it. Now, because it is Easter Sunday, the tomb is empty, that our Lord and Savior has risen from the grave. All right. And so with that, I'm going to start there. All right. Let me start there and then make my way to Ephesians chapter one. Trust me, it's going to make a lot of sense. All right. You guys with me? You ready? All right, so Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We're looking at the resurrection. Verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. Uh, these are uh, Jesus' uh, disciples, the females, the women. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. I want to stop here for a moment and, and make the point. Look, I believe there's two reasons why they didn't believe these women. Uh, reason number one is, quite frankly, if someone walked in through those doors yelling that someone has risen from the grave, I'm pretty sure many of us would be like, ah, uh, has this person escaped from hospital? Are you okay? Like, let's just be real. Let's just be honest. Because that's what's going on now, right? They show up and they're like, like he's, he's not there. He has risen from the grave. It's like, mm, we're a little uncomfortable. That's reason number one. Reason number two is because back in the day, the testimony of a woman was not taken seriously. So already they're just going, well, we're not going to believe you because you're a, you're a woman. You're a woman. But how foolish they must have looked when they realized that these women were telling the truth. The fact that Jesus chose that, that the first witnesses of the resurrection would be women. Oh, there's a sermon there, but I don't have time. The text goes, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Amazed at what had happened. This is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. Jesus' resurrection has so many implications for our lives. I've already mentioned this. It has so many implications for our lives. Uh, a friend uh, that I have gotten to know a little bit, and I really admire him, his name is Joby Martin, he says this, if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. Yeah. Let, let me say that again, because I know many of us, we, we, we haven't quite resonated with that. If the tomb is empty, oh, then anything is possible. Anything is possible. And I could say so much on that, and, and I will, because we're going to jump into a new sermon series that's going to unpack more of these implications of what it means that the tomb is empty. But for this morning, because I only have a few minutes with you, I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 1 and show us some of the implications of the fact that the tomb is empty, that he has risen from the grave. And because this tomb is empty... 
And because Jesus right now, right now is seated at the right hand of the Father praying for us, there is so much that we can celebrate. That there is so much that, 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 that we can lean into with expectation of his strength and his might. Because the tomb is empty, hear me, friends, we have so many blessings. So many blessings that, that you are blessed. If you've crossed the line of faith, you are blessed beyond measure. Because of the resurrection, you are blessed. And, uh, and who wouldn't want to be? Who wouldn't want to be? I know some of us will go, no, 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 you know, my, my theology is so reformed, it's so conservative that, you know, I'm not going to walk into that trap on it. No, let's be honest. We all want to be blessed. Each and every one of us. And because the tomb is empty, we have so many blessings. Paul in Ephesians lays out some of these blessings that we have received because of Jesus and his resurrection. And so this morning we're going to walk through some of those. We're going to walk through some of those very, very quickly. And so Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1 here at Root of Fellowship, we literally go line by line by line, and that's what we're going to do. So verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. This is just simply telling us who wrote this letter. It was Paul. To the faithful sense saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, who this letter is addressed to. It's to the church in Ephesus. But we know that today that this letter is also addressed to us. So to Rooted Fellowship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He puts that in there just to say, these aren't my words, these come from my Father. Just want to let you know. They come from my Father. And then he says in verse 3, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. This should cause us to just stop, because I know many of us, we just, we read right past this, trying to get to like our favorite verses, you know, our memory verses, and we skip verses like this, but this is jam-packed with so much goodness. Paul is saying something massive here. To put it plainly, Paul says, for those who are in Christ, God has blessed us with every, 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 every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Now, to be honest, this shouldn't come to us as a surprise. If we're being honest, if we're saying that we are faithful uh, uh, folks who read our Bible regularly, it shouldn't come to us as a surprise that, that God in Christ has given us every spiritual blessing. Because why would God would withhold any blessing from us? He has already given us his first and best in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 32 says this, He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? He's given us Jesus, his first and his best. Why would he withhold anything else? There's this uh, illustration that I love to use. I got it from someone else, but you know how the illustrations go. The first time, you quote the person. The second time, you say, someone once said. The third time, it's yours, all right? So this is mine. So, so it, it would be like this. It'd be, it'd be proposing to my wife and then opening up that box, and then she sees the engagement ring, and like it had this shine. Literally, the sun was shining on it. It blinded everybody that was around us. That's how epic it was. And then she takes the ring, and then I put it on her finger. It's, it's a beautiful moment. And then she looks at me, and she says, oh, no, can I have the box? Now, what, would, would, would I go, no. No, 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 no. You, you can't have the box. Because the box also had a price. It was expensive and it was... No, I wouldn't do that. I'd be like, you can have anything you want. I, I have given you that which in that moment is most precious to me. You can have anything you want. That's what God is saying. He says, I've given you my first and best in Jesus Christ. Why would I withhold anything from you? So it shouldn't come to us as a surprise when we are told every spiritual blessing has been given to those who are in Christ Jesus and what blessings they are. Now, you might be sitting here and going, Oni, this is great. I never realized that. Wow. Okay, Oni, what are they? Th that, that's my hope. That's the hope. that I, 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 ho I hope you're asking that question, like, what, what, what are they? 
It's almost like Paul knew that that would be the next question. And so he spends the next few verses unpacking these blessings. Because he knows, he knows that if he didn't, we would take his words to places that he never intended them to go. And so we must ask, what are those blessings? Be specific, Paul. Now, remember, we want to answer what these spiritual blessings are. But in order to understand what they are, we need to understand where they are. And for us to understand where they are, we need to understand who they are. Did did, did you hear me? To understand what they are, we need to understand where they are. To understand where they are, we need to understand who they are. And this is of first importance. It is of first importance. And so what is this blessing? Who is this blessing? Oh, no, what are you talking about? Here, let me go ahead and tell you. It's God. God our Father. And if you miss that, you've missed everything. And many of us do. God our Father, that's where it begins. He is the one who gives the blessings. We find ourselves going to all these different places hoping to find the blessings there. No, 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 no. They sit with our Father who is seated on His throne. But then what he does is he says, I'm going to place all the blessings in my son, Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus says that no one can come to the Father except through me. He places all his blessings in his son, Jesus Christ. So who is it? It's God. Where is it? It's in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Friends, this is why we celebrate Easter. We remind one another of where we are to go to find life and meaning. In the resurrected Jesus Christ. We cannot separate the spiritual blessings from God and how we try, but we cannot separate the spiritual blessings from God who has placed them in Christ Jesus. Now, having said that, let's unpack, let's unpack these spiritual blessings. Uh, I want you to know that, that this is not like a buffet menu. Right, as we make our way through them, don't sit there and go, mm, no, I'll pass on that one, pass on that one, I'll definitely take that one. Can I get two of those? That's not how it works. You, you get all of them. It's like, it's like one plate with all the food that's on there. It's like seven colors. The minute you take out the beetroots, it's not seven colors anymore. It's just a really cool dish. You get all the spiritual blessings. All right? So let's walk through them. Spiritual blessing number one, verse four. It says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. What's the blessing? You are chosen. You are chosen. And not just randomly chosen, but you are chosen before the foundation of the world. Friends, we marvel at the universe. And part of our marveling is is because we we don't quite understand it. Every time we, we, we learn something new, we realize, wow, there's so much more to learn. And for those who are in Christ, we're told, no, 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 you were chosen But before I did all of that, God says, I had a plan for you. There is a big fancy word we use called predestination. We find it in verse 5. This simply means that God foreknew us, that he had prior knowledge of us, that he had a plan for us, that he, he knew what we were going to look like, what we were going to do long before our parents even thought of us. He had foreknowledge, which means that he foreloved us. Now, I know it doesn't sound like great English, but trust me, it's great theology. It is great theology. We were created out of an overflow of love. God didn't create us because he needed us created out of an overflow of love that, that existed between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is beautiful to know because it tells us that no one is a mistake. Regardless of how you got here, and when I say here, I mean here on earth. Because I know some of us have stories. We have testimonies. Our beginning was not a great one. But here's the thing. That is not your beginning. That God had a plan for you. You are chosen. For those in Christ, you are chosen. So, so stop sitting in that, oh, but here's how I started. Here are my origins. No, 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 no. 
foreknowledge, forelove, predestination. And this should blow our minds because we know us. You know you. In your broken, sinful state, God goes, no, 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 I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. You are chosen. And not only did he choose us, but he did so to be holy and blameless in love before him, the Bible tells us. Which simply means that we we were chosen to be set apart. Chosen to be set apart, to be different, to be distinct. Now, living in a country such as this, with, with so much diversity, we understand distinction. You know, the Zulu... Zulu people are different to to Peri people. English people are are different to Venda people. Tswana people very different. I've been told I've been told that when Tswana people speak, it's it's like it's poetry. It's poetry in motion. I've I've hey I'm not trying. I've been told. I've I've been told. So 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 they are distinctions. We know that, and and, and it's the same for the people of God. For those who have been chosen, you have been set apart that that you should be distinct. For those in Christ, what makes you different from those who don't trust Jesus as Lord and Savior is the fact that you are holy. That's what makes you different is that you are holy, that you are set apart. Now, I, I know that this might sound weird for a lot of us because I don't feel holy. Right? I don't feel holy. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Be careful about feelings. They're super helpful to kind of figure out things and life and people, but they're horrible saviors. Horrible saviors. And so I get it. We don't feel holy because, man, I know me. I don't have holy thoughts all the time. I don't do holy things all the time. I know me. But, but this is why this blessing is so beautiful. B- because God looks at you and he goes, I, I already know that you're not holy. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my son who is holy and and I'm going to have him exchange his holiness for your unholiness. That's the gospel. That's why the good news is good news. Is that you you don't have to do anything. In fact, you can't do anything to gain salvation for yourself. You need Christ and his holiness to come over you and clothe you. He's the one that kept all the laws. He's the one that kept all the rules. Not you and I. And I know some of us are sitting here going, but Onea, man, I hear you, but I'm a good person. Compared to who? (laughs) Who are you comparing yourself to? The criminal with a life sentence? Absolutely you're a good person in comparison. But they're not the standard. You're not the standard. I'm not the standard. The standard is perfection, and that is Jesus Christ. And so God, in a sense, is saying to us, hey, stop, stop, just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He's the one that kept the law. He's the one that walked the earth and did so in a perfect way that pleased the Father. And so we just get to clothe ourselves with his holiness. Because I know we struggle to keep God's law, but here's the thing, we struggle to keep our own. How's your New Year's resolution going? That's yours. That's your own law. That's your rule that you came up with and even you struggle with it. So you just find yourself uh, adjusting, uh, let me change this, upgrading, I've changed this. Here's God. My law is the same. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Standard perfection. You can't. Jesus can. So surrender your life to him. But because you are in Christ, because Jesus has resurrected, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, we clothe ourselves with his holiness, then that means that you are declared holy. And you are being made holy. I I, I hope that that's somewhat confusing, because that's good. If it is confusing, then you need to come for our series that we're going to jump into, because we're going to unpack a lot of that. But that's the gospel truth, is that you are declared holy. God looks at you, and he sees Jesus first, and then he sees you. And because of that, then therefore you are declared holy. But at the same time, God is working in and through you. And so that sinful, bruised, broken state, it's catching up. That's what it means. He's working in you. He's working in you progressively. 
It's a beautiful gospel truth. And, and this holiness, this holiness is made possible because you are forgiven. That's how. If you're sitting there and going, how? How is that even possible? How can I be declared holy? It's because you've been forgiven. Verse 5 tells us that it pleased God to do so. It says here, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Friends, God wasn't tricked into this. He wasn't forced to do this, but, but it put a smile on his face. It brought him great joy to lavish grace upon us, to bless us in this way. It brings him great glory, and it gives us great joy. And so we thank God for this beautiful gift of grace that takes us from death to life, from darkness to light, from orphan to child. We, we thank God for this grace. And all of this is given, all of this is possible through his resurrected son, Jesus, whom he loves and is well pleased. You are chosen. Spiritual blessing number two, verse seven. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. What is spiritual Blessing number two, you are redeemed. You are redeemed. Now, now the definition of redemption in Paul's time meant the, the, the payment of a price to deliver someone. The purchase of a slave. That's, that's what it meant back then. But here's the thing. I believe that this definition has lost its meaning today. Because we don't see ourselves as slaves. We think of ourselves as free. Before Jesus Christ, we think of ourselves as free. I get to do whatever it is that I want. No, you have a master who's beating to the drum of what he wants for you to do. And what are you doing? You're just dancing to it. We aren't free. The Bible sees humanity as slaves to sin without Jesus. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, we see Jesus' first sermon. And in there, he says, he was sent to liberate us. Why would we need liberation if we're free? It's not a true question. It's because we're not free. We need the great liberator to come and set us free. But for us to understand this, we need to acknowledge that we are in bondage. For those who are not in Christ, you are in bondage. And it's a hard truth to hear, but it is. You're a slave to sin, in desperate need of a savior. You're in need of his redemption. Now, how does Jesus redeem us? By dying on the cross. By dying on the cross. There's another big fancy word. We've covered predestination. Here's another one. Propitiation. That's fancy, huh? That money went somewhere. Thank you, mama. <laughs> Propitiation which simply means a price that satisfies. A price that satisfies. And when Jesus was nailed to that cross, body broken, he bled out. A price was paid. And this is why he cries out to tell us die. It is finished. This Greek word, tetelestai, was a, a common word back in the day. It was used when, when, when folks had finished paying a debt, they would shout out, tetelestai. Now, I know some of you know what that feels like, because I know you've been in debt. Some of you are like, I'm hoping to feel that one day, one day I'll be able to. But, but that feeling when you've, when you've paid off that debt, you know that feeling? You shout out to Telestai, it is finished. This is why Jesus cried that out, because he said it's done, it's finished, it's over, no more. No longer do you Israelites year after year have to go find a spotless lamb and show up at the temple and have these rituals and 
cut it open and let it bleed out and that will cover the sins for the year and then you've got to come back and do it again. No, 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 no. It's done. It's done. We are redeemed. Now, I know some people, they look at the cross, especially over this weekend, they look at the cross and they're like, man, did, did, they really, did, did, they, did God really have to go through that whole thing? Like, did, was that necessary? Could, couldn't God just simply sweep it under the rug? Right? Couldn't he just be like, hey, it's okay, don't worry about it? He couldn't. He couldn't because all forgiveness is costly. All forgiveness is costly. Here's what Tim Keller says. He says, God's grace and forgiveness, while free to the recipient, is always costly for the giver. From the earliest parts of the Bible, it was understood that God could not forgive without sacrifice. No one who is seriously wronged can just forgive the perpetrator. You and I know that. Let's be honest. I know that even right now where you are sitting, you're thinking about people that you just like, I, I just can't bring myself to forgive them. Because it's going to cost me too much. And, and here's why. When you forgive, this means you absorb the loss and the debt. You bear it yourself. That is why all forgiveness is costly. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why did he have to bleed for us? If God was to forgive us, it was going to cost something. And you and I, in our hands, have nothing to give that is of worth. Nothing. Friends, to die for a good man is a tough thing. But for one who has done you wrong, now that's a God thing. It requires resurrection power. This is why when we forgive people, I think we actually need to start with, not I forgive you, but in the name of Jesus, I forgive you. Because let's be honest, I, me, in my own strength, never, never. There are people in my life who have wronged me so, so badly that it, like I just, like I grind my, even the thought of them I begin to grind, like your face changes. It's like, what's wrong with you? But in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, I forgive you. How does God die for us? According to the riches of his grace, the verse tells us. See, God has, in, has an infinite wealth of grace, which tells us that nothing is beyond his grace. Nothing is beyond his grace. Nothing that you and I have done is beyond his grace. You cannot outrun the grace of God. Oh, and some of us are running. The lies that we tell ourselves, oh, I'm not good enough. If only he knew what I, like what I did. Like, there's no ways. There's no ways that God can forgive. He does know what you've done. To the T. But nothing is beyond his grace. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Oh, I think some of you all missed that. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Sometimes we just need to let that sink in. Let it, let it go to the areas where we don't, we don't want people there. In fact, we don't even want God there. The dark areas of our lives where like, we're just like, that's, an, that's the ugly me. We need to take this word and force it there. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. This act of redemption was not fo a foolish move on God's part. It, it wasn't a waste of grace, but it was a move made in wisdom. The text tells us this, that he richly poured out on us with all what? Wisdom. And he knew exactly what he was doing. Exactly what he was doing. He knows what he's doing, so stop doubting his work in and through you. Stop. Today, in the name of Jesus, stop. He knows what he's doing in and through you. Because you are redeemed. Spiritual blessing number three. I love this one. You are included. Look at verse nine. It says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ 
as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. Friends, because you are redeemed, this means that you are also included. The word mystery in the New Testament is defined as a shadow that is now revealed in full light. That's what mystery means. Unlike today where mystery is something entirely unknown. That's how we understand a mystery. God, God is not a magician, right? He's not like pulling out cool tricks and like, oh, there was nothing there and now it's here, surprise. He's not pulling a rabbit out of a hat. That's not what he's doing. No, no, this has always been the plan. And, and, and friends, let's be honest. If we really just read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, we would see that this has always been the plan of God. That right out the gates, Genesis chapter 3, we see a sacrifice being made and then he clothes them because they were naked and ashamed, but he clothes them. Right out the gates, he's like, I've got a plan for humanity. And we are included in that. We're included because of the resurrected Jesus. We're included in that plan. The mystery is God's master plan for the world is, is this. What's the, what is it? It's Jesus. That Jesus is uniting all things to himself. He's bringing all things to himself. That's the plan. And you're included. Everything is to be summed up in Jesus. See, here's what sin makes us do. It makes us focus on our tiny little stories. Me, myself, and I. The whole time. When we do that, we miss out on the grand plan of God, of what he's doing. This is why I believe that we can say, God, give us the nations. Give us the nations. Because you are doing something grand. You're doing something massive. It's not just about me. Yes, I'm included, but you, you, you're at work in my workplace, in my community, in the classroom, in my family. You're at work. Those who have been chosen in love by God have been included in God's grand master plan. Why is this important for us to know? Well, because it tells us that all loose ends in our lives all the injustices we see, all the brokenness, all of it will be finished in Jesus, that God has the last word. And for those who are in Christ, this is good news. It is finished. It's good news. And so you are included. Spiritual blessing number four. We're going to move quite quickly now. Verse 11, it says, in him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. You have an inheritance, friends. Now, now I know, I know, I know for our context, this idea of an inheritance is a very difficult one to understand. I know that. Can we be real for a moment? It's very similar to, to when someone says, God is our father. In our context, we go... That's hard for me to understand. God is Lord. God is King. Sure, I get that. God is sovereign. Okay, but God is Father. I, I don't quite understand that because I've never had a father. Oh, I do have a father, but he's not present. He's not involved. He's not caring. He's not loving. He's not tender. And so every time someone says, come to God as your father, the first picture you get is your earthly father. And so it's like, this is hard for me to understand. Inheritance is the same. This context doesn't understand what an inheritance is because it's like, sometimes I go, I feel like I'm the inheritance. Black tax is real. But, but that's not how the kingdom of God should work. Honor your mother and father 100%. Give and serve and love in your communities 100%. But hear me, you have an inheritance from God. And that has implications on our lives. It should shape the way we do things. I don't do things simply for this world. I do this for, 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 for what awaits me, the reward that awaits me. And here's what the Bible says about our inheritance. First, Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says this about our inheritance. Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. I've got, I've got some, some bad news for some of you. 
Because I know some of you guys are storing up an inheritance here on earth. And, and look, I'm not, I'm not against being a good steward. 100% you should do that. But you're holding on to these earthly things, forgetting your inheritance in heaven. And you're going, man, I can't wait to give this inheritance to my children. It's going to be amazing. Not realizing that some of your kids, they're just going to squander that stuff. Literally, they're just going to squander it. Now, my, my prayer is that they don't, but you don't know. So take hold of that which you do. That which is imperishable, unfading. It's for sure. And I'm telling you, it, cha- it, change, it changes. John Wesley, old, 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 old man, died many years ago but loved Jesus, apparently was riding his horse one day. And, and some of his servants came to him and they ran and said, John, 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 your, your, your house is on fire. But thankfully no one was in there, but, but it's, it's burnt down. Says so John kept quiet, thought about it for a moment, and he said, well, it's not my house, it's the Lord's house that's on fire. And he carried on, went on about on his horse. That's, that's a mat. Now, I'm not saying don't get insurance, get house insurance, 100%, okay? But it's about perspective. That everything that I have belongs to the Lord. And I don't hold on to earthly things. I hold on to the Lord. My inheritance in Christ is imperishable. My inheritance in Christ is undefiled. My inheritance in Christ is unfading. My inheritance in Christ is reserved, which means it's booked. Done deal. See, when we understand and value the glory that awaits us, we're able to better understand the life that we live in today. It allows us to endure, to endure whatever life throws at us. We can give God praise even during trials because we have His inheritance that we will receive. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. That needs to sink in for some of us. Special blessing number five, last one. Verse 13, it says, In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. What's the last one? You are sealed. You are sealed. I love that we get to hear about the Holy Spirit here because it reminds us the, that the work of our salvation is the work of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us to inform those who have crossed the line of faith that God will never let us go. This is why you're sealed. He will never let you go. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit is the deposit. And there is no return on the children of God. Some of us, we, we, we think God's holding on to the receipt. Right? Tell us, die. It's paid. It's finished. Paid in full. But God's holding on to the receipt, and he's like, oh, no, I'm just waiting to see what you're going to do with your life. So that I can return you when I don't like you anymore. When you're not being obedient enough, I'll just return you. I mean, that's what we do, right? We hold on to receipts because we're like, hey, if this thing breaks, I'm taking it back. I'm not even asking questions. I'm just going to walk up to the thing. Here, here you go. Can I get another one? I can get my money back. God's not doing that. You come to Christ, the Holy Spirit is deposited in you, and he seals you, and that's it. Done. Finished. We are sealed. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. This means that we are God's possession. And and we're not just any item on God's shelf. We're God's prized possession. You are God's prized possession. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 7 says this. It says, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence 
that we will inherit eternal life. Literally, that's everything I've just preached. And for those who've crossed the line of faith, that's yours. That's yours. That's what you have. And so live in light of that. Every spiritual blessing is yours in the resurrected Christ. You are chosen. You are redeemed. You are included. You have an inheritance and you are sealed. So live like that. So many of us are chasing the good life. Not realizing that, no, no, no. You have the resurrected life. Which is way better than the so-called good life that the world wants to sell you. And it's almost like the world knows that it, 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 can't, it can't satisfy, right? So that's why it's constantly changing the whole time. Always upgrading. No, I, I want to keep my eyes on the one who is constant. Who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That the promises he made to Paul are the same that he makes to us today. There's no upgraded. These blessings aren't like the new iPhone. You know the new one, there's like a newer, newer one, and then the newer, newer one. It's not like that. So, so live in light of them. Paul is so overjoyed, so blown away by what we receive in the resurrected Christ, that, that, that if you read this passage in the original text, verses 3 to 14 is literally one long sentence. I know in the English there's commas and full stops and all that cool stuff, but in the actual original Greek language, it's just one long sentence. It's like he started writing and was just so blown away that he couldn't lift his hand off the paper. I hope that you're filled with that kind of joy. That kind of marvel. Being blown away by the wonder of God that he would choose you. Paul is so blown away that he prays. That's what he does. Verse 15 is literally a prayer. He's like, I just I just don't I don't get that 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 Jesus would die for me. That he would die for me. And that when I surrender my life to him, I don't just get a ticket to heaven, but but I get all these spiritual blessings for me. My only response is to pray. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to respond. Because all of us must respond. We must respond. My hope is that you would respond now. Because I know there are people who are just like, "Uh, I I don't believe in this Jesus stuff. Okay. But there is a day coming where you will respond. The Bible tells us that every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. God's grace is that he's saying to you now, you can do that by your own will right now. Because when you are forced to do so, it'll be too late. This is why when we preach and teach this, we do so desperation, but also with expectation that he is able. Amen?